bit about what you've, um, how you've investigated the Powder Lodge and kind of give a picture about what the archaeology of the site's like. Um, if you walk out there today, you will see a grassy lawn with a building on it. And there's a lot that goes on underneath the ground. And then afterwards, I'll take some questions. And there is information from the Historical Society and some artifacts up here if you want to look at them. And John Hodson, uh, president of the Cape Valley Historical Society, has a video that he'll start showing. You're welcome to watch it. And it is on YouTube if you don't have the time to, if you have to leave and still want to see it. And there's several other videos as well on YouTube. So, so this is the Collier Lodge building. Uh, you know, right now here's an example of us working at it, and you can see uh, there's a building, and north is that way, and there's a grassy lawn, and there are different holes that have been dug into it, and people walk around working stuff. And we've been investigating the site since 1983, and we've done a lot of or 1993. It just seems like 83, right? Uh, but um, we've done a lot of different kinds of work there. And some of the site's different, like an outhouse-like looking building, that's not there anymore, that disappeared. Um, but um, I'm going to show you what, how you can investigate a site and learn about it. Um, and this site was used by a lot of different people. This was a place where you could cross the Kankakee Marsh. So if you were going to rest and cross over, um, the other places, I mean, you have to go almost to the other side of Lake County or to LaPorte County to be able to cross the Kankakee Marsh and you know, imagine if the only bridge to Jasper County, for example, the only way to get there would be you could go two counties either way. You know, you can imagine that someplace like this would be a big area to live on. And prehistoric people lived there beginning as early as 8,000 BC and uh, going up all the way up until what we call the proto-historic. Uh, that's a time period that's before the historic period but it's when you start to see trade goods coming in. You know, the Native, um, the French, for example, were in Canada, and they were trading with Native Americans, and those Native Americans, who, they would take a worn out knife and trade it to somebody in Michigan, who eventually would trade it to somebody in Indiana, and then they'd throw it away at Collier Lodge. We see a few, very few artifacts from that time period. Mainly things like beads and gun flicks, but we do see things from there. Um, but these are the different cultural periods that we look at, and, and that within that, we have things we call phases, which are kind of more specific time periods or cultural areas that we talk about how people live. And what, and all the light blue ones are the phases that are present at our site. The dark blue ones are not present. So it's kind of interesting that some time periods were not, are not represented at the site. And it's a little bit mysterious about why that would be the case. Because they're all over, you know, it's not like they weren't in the county. They were often nearby, but they weren't at Collier Lodge, <coughs> uh, as far as we know. And some of these phases are unnamed. That's because um, we haven't done enough, people haven't done enough research on them to be able to, like, describe their characteristics. You know, I don't know if you know what an ethnography is, but that's a, a kind of a description of the way a culture would live. You know, where you talk about where they lived and, you know, what kind of foods they ate and what kind of houses they lived in and tools they used and their social organization, their religion. Well, as much as you could do that, you could kind of define a phase. And there's been a lot of work on the middle, early woodland period, the middle woodland period, um, and the later periods, but these earlier periods just have not been studied. And we get some data from them at Collier Lodge, but, you know, we haven't been able to name any phases yet. <coughs> And then there's the historic eras and events. Like this place was busy, right? So beginning in 1600, we start to find the first European trade goods. Now the historic period begins in 1680. Prior to that, nobody had come to northern Indiana with a book to write anything down. And that's what makes the historic period, where you have written history records. But in 1679, in the late winter, uh, LaSalle went through South Bend, and he went into the Kankakee River, you know, the St. Joseph River went into the Kankakee on his way to the port to the Mississippi, and using the portage on the Kankakee, and with him, he had a uh, military officer, who of course wrote down like how many miles we traveled and who we saw, you know, in the terrain, and then he had a priest who just wrote all kinds of stuff. And that, and LaSalle must have passed the site. The site is on the river. You know, and he must have gone by it. Maybe he even camped at it. But if he did, he didn't like lose a button off his shirt that said La property of LaSalle. You know, that would be cool. 
But we do have stuff from that era, so he may have, who knows, maybe he camped at the site. And he certainly saw it, it was a prominent bluff, uh, but they went through in the dead of winter and it was pretty sparsely inhabited. In 1820 to 1832, it was called Pottawatomie Ford because the Pottawatomie Indians camped there when they crossed back and forth over the marsh. There was a ferry established in 1834, and sometime between 1830 and 1850, there was a, a Euro-American uh, cabin was built there. Um, there was a bridge and a sawmill, Balms Bridge and Sawmill, and that's what the, the road is named, it's on Balms Bridge Road, and that's what gave us the road. Balm built a bridge, everybody else tried to make bridges, they didn't really work, but he made the first bridge, which the county then took over. And that's not why they call it Bowles Bridge. Then there was a hunting club here in 1878. The Kentucky Marsh was not farm land yet. It was a big swamp marsh. And hunting lodges were established. And shortly thereafter, the Collier Lodge was built, we think. The white building you see was built as a lodge, like an inn or hotel, where you could come and hunt and fish at the marsh and stay in the hotel. It was really nice and convenient. Unfortunately, in 1922, the marsh was drained to become farmland. So that was like not a real good business model, right? 20-year business model. And then the lodge um, became, was owned by Jim Collier, and it was really Collier's Lodge. And then Jim Collier inherited it. It was kind of a little country store and grocery and a, like an inn, country inn. And then Jim Collier died. And through the 1960s to the 90s, he was periodically abandoned and used as a residence. And then in, in 2001, John Hobson purchased it, and we kind of entered that Kentucky Valley Historical Society era. So if you look at all these time periods, for the past 8,000 years, up until the present, you can find artifacts at the site or features from any one of these time periods could potentially be present. And try to figure out which ones are present, which ones are intact, which ones can tell us about the site, is a really important thing that we're trying to, trying to learn at the site. So what have we done since 2003? We've done shovel probe surveys. We've done soil resistivity. We've done magnetic surveys. We've done ground penetrating radar. And we've done excavation. And I'll talk about what each one of those, each one of those, why do we do so many different things? Uh, well, it's because each thing gives you a different perspective on the site. And if you put them all together, you get a much better idea of what the structure of the site is like and what is there. So the, one of the first things we did was we did uh, resistivity surveys. And then we stick a probe in the ground and move it around, and there's some reference probes, and you send an electrical current in the soil, and that current then is conducted by moisture in the soil, and you can see if things are there, like if there's a buried pile of bricks, that'll stop the current from flowing. It'll be a high resistance area. If the soil's really rich with organic material, like there's a trash pit, then it'll hold water and it'll conduct electricity. It'll be low in resistance. And here's a, a map of the res resistance, soil resistance at the lodge. There's that lodge building. This is about 20 meters, uh, this is 10 meters, about 30 feet square. And each little square is about a meter square. And blue is low resistance, and red is high resistance. So we have a big blot of low resistance in the middle of this site. So there's something, something about that soil there that actually is the highest part of the site. You know, that's actually conducting electricity pretty well. You know, the, the site is really sandy, so you'd expect the top soils to be dry because they're well drained. But it's interesting this soil conducts electricity so well. Then there's high areas of red where the soil is uh, pretty compact, okay? And we also did shovel probe surveys. And for those, basically we set up a grid and we dig a little hole with a shovel and we just sift the dirt from that hole and collect all the artifacts and then we can plot them. And we can also look at the profiles in the hole, look at the soil in the hole. And what's interesting is if you look at this, some of these holes, we did three different seasons of shovel probing. Some of these holes produce prehistoric artifacts, and some don't. That red line is like the, the limit of prehistoric artifacts. Every hole above that produced at least one prehistoric artifact. Every hole below the red line basically produced like either just some historic stuff or no prehistoric artifacts, or maybe nothing at all. 
So we can see that the prehistoric part of the site is in the northern part of this property that we have. So that helps us focus in our investigation. And so we probably don't want to go, if we're looking interested in prehistoric, we don't want to go digging down south of them, what we call the N60 line. We have a grid on this site. It's like an XY grid. Oops, I got that again. And actually, this is kind of interesting. There's a little different resistivity thing on the, on the left, where the green is high resistance and the blue is super high resistance, or low resistance. The green is low resistance, it's conducting electricity. The blue is super low resistance, and the red then is high resistance. And there on the blue line there is that artifact line. And you can see how the artifact line kind of correlates with that, um, with that green area of low resistance. And if we look in the probes and look at what the soil's like, what we see is that the soil where the prehistoric people left their artifacts has been changed by their activities. They would do things, they would burn fires, and they would throw out trash, and it changes the chemistry of the soil so it actually conducts electricity better. It's called mitten. It's soil kind of mixed with garbage and enriched by organic stuff. So basically, we can use the resistivity to get ideas where the midden is most dense. And that's to the north there. There used to be a shed where this blue thing was. And when they took the shed down, apparently they kind of just, the soil was disturbed, and it made an area of really low resistance. Same thing in those little blue squares at the top. There used to be a, a concrete pad for a garage there. So when they took that out, they kind of softened up the soil. So basically, this kind of, the resistivity confirms that the site is in the, the main heart of the site with the most potential to learn about the past. It's north of N60 and a little bit to the east. There's a pointer up there if you want to use it. If that helps. Yeah, maybe it will. I don't know what that blue dot is. That could be, oh, that was an excavation unit that we had in the past that we just had filled in, right? So even that shows up um, as something on the resistance so we can find past units. If you want to do a magnetic survey, this gives you a little bit more, a different type of information. Um, we use a thing called a radiometer. We lay on a grid. We always be able to take our data on the grid. And if there's something buried below the surface that can interact with the Earth's magnetic field, it makes a magnetic signal that the instrument can pick up. And so we gather the data. There's a little computer here. And then we can put that in a better computer and get a picture of it. And that's you know, just like with the resistance data. So this is a different kind of thing. We might ask, you know, we can pick up metal artifacts like iron. That would interact. But even like a burnt rock, a lot of burnt rock is somewhat magnetic. Because when you heat the rock, the iron particles line up with the Earth's magnetic field. And then when it cools, it's like, like very weakly interacting with the magnetic field. So here's one resistance map. And red means high resistance. And blue means, I'm, I'm sorry, high magnetic signal. And blue means low. And you, these things are called dipoles. They're paired high and low. And that's almost always the signal. That's a signal of iron. Because iron really interacts strongly with the Earth's magnetic field. <coughs> these things can be little tiny pieces of iron. Or these yellow things could even be something like a prehistoric fireplace. So here's an interesting thing right here. I mean, that is definitely artificial. And that was a total surprise. I mean, it's clearly artificial, square. And you can't see anything on the surface where that's at. It's just grass. And we think this is the foundation of a little cottage that once stood by the lodge. There's one picture of it in the background, right in this location. So that's a little cottage from the 1920s or 30s. And that would be really cool for archaeologists like in 500 years, right? Right now, I'm not really interested in it. Um, this is some scattered metal, probably from the garage that was here. We find a lot of like car parts and like spark plugs and stuff in this area. We find a badge, like a front badge from like a 1960s Cadillac. We're still digging for the rest of the Cadillac. <laughs> Anybody in the field school that finds the rest of the Cadillac, if it's still running, they get it. Um, and then there's these things here. It's useful. These things we don't want to dig. We shovel probed over one. These are like septic tanks or dry wells, right? So we kind of want to avoid those. <laughs> and then this is a bunch of iron. There's a, this was a dump. The woods down here was used in a dump. And I think it's just trash that spilled over from the dump into the yard. And then this might have been an outhouse. 
that was used. Here, that outhouse that was sitting by the lodge, that was originally sitting down here, which makes me think that's where the outhouse was. Some people like to dig in privies. They're called privies. is like a polite term for an outhouse. And people like to dig in those from the like 1800s, but I do not want to dig in one from the 1960s. <laughs> but here's, um, this is what's called plus or minus 135 nanotesla. The nanotesla is the unit of magnetic intensity. This one's 175 nanotesla. So right away you can see more things are cropping up. Some of the dipoles are bigger, and there's these little things become more obvious. Um, in here. <coughs> but here's the problem. This is plus or minus 25 nanotesla. This is this range. If I was looking at a prehistoric site and I wanted to find prehistoric fireplaces or prehistoric ho houses, this is the setting I would use for that. And there is so much metal at Collier Lodge that the metal overwhelms every other signal of the prehistoric signal. So we haven't been able to use magnetic surveys to find any prehistoric deposits at Collier Lodge. They're just completely overtaken by all the historic metal that was there. And I suppose you could estimate, like we had one unit, one square, that we put on this unit right here. And the, I don't know if we actually got that, that bipole, dipole, but one unit there produced 10 pounds of nails. You know, so that's like just a pile of nails. All in two levels. So that was kind of disappointing to the students. They thought that would be a really exciting phenomenon. But it was a good nail collection, though. So now here, um, I played, here's the magnetic stuff, plus or minus 75. And I've overlaid that on the excavation. And this shows you know, where we've worked. We pretty much have worked in this area up here. And we haven't got. If we try to go this way, we're going to get into all this historic metal from the problem from by the garage. Uh, this unit here was interesting. It was um, these squares are excavation units, and that was really shallow. We dug there because it produced artifacts from the 1830s, but they were just really shallow, and it just produced miscellaneous stuff all mixed together. So apparently, there's not any structure there, but there's more material over here. And I don't know. We have to go back and survey and see if that anomaly is still there. But then this is all the stuff that was thrown away south of the shed, I think. You know, when they were, um, had that shed there, they put stuff behind it probably so people would have to, you know, so it wouldn't be visible from the road, it wouldn't look quite so bad, I think. We also use ground penetrating radar. And that allows us to um, actually see, the problem with the resistance and the magnetic stuff is, you get a map of, from the surface. You don't get much depth information. Um, or you just get a certain depth. This lets us get at those depths, and we've only done a pretty small area in detail, although last year we did expand it and did a lot of surveys down here, and I just don't have that data worked up to show you, even now. But here's, um, in this big square, here's the results. Uh, this is an excavation unit, and this is a slice that's about 30 centimeters below the surface. And I know that because this excavation unit was excavated the year before, it was filled, covered with plastic and then filled in, and it was 30 centimeters deep. So we're looking at the actual reflection of the plastic, because the plastic doesn't conduct electricity. It really shows up on radar. And next to that is some kind of historic debris. This is what we call feature one. That was a brick fireplace from a log cabin made of handmade bricks. And this is undoubtedly a pipe or two. I don't know what that is. This was an unknown anomaly that was out in the field. That turned out to be a really dense concentration of burnt rock with prehistoric artifacts. It was buried about 30 centimeters below the surface. And it's interesting, if you take a slice of this data, you can go up with the data. If you take a shallower slice, this blob moves on. This thing here, I like to put my hand. I'm better at it. This blob here actually moves this way. And that's what it does in the archaeology. It's actually a sloping layer of rock, cracked rock. It starts down deep and goes up to uh, shallower. So we actually see this anomaly move along in our slices. And also we've used excavation. And we've done a lot of excavation. We started really in 2004 with excavations and um, 
have done, we just did show probably in 2003. And ever since that year, we opened some units, some we worked on for a couple of years. Um, the bright green units are the ones we did last year. And basically the major features we've been working on, first we found feature one, the red square, that fireplace. And then we went either side of it, looking for evidence of a cabin. And we found a, that red rectangular thing is where the basement, we think the basement or wood cellar of the cabin was. And we spent a lot of time now investigating that wood cellar type thing and putting units in other places. But I'm going to talk about three main areas. The one on the top, upper right, is a prehistoric roasting pit. The one on the middle is the northern corner of that basement. We were looking for that. And the uh, one on the bottom left is the other corner of the basement. Those green squares where we're looking for corners of this basement feature. So first <coughs> I'll deal with the, the basement feature. And I'll start with the one right in the middle. Um, so there you can see where it's at by the cabin. And they basically stake out this unit, looking at the maps. The students have to go through um, previous records or previous years. We take notes on everything and make maps. And they looked at them and they said, okay, based on that, we think this square right here will be right on the corner of the basement. And that's where we want to excavate. So they chose that as an excavation area. And they began to work down in levels. And we found our biggest rock in this unit. You know, which is kind of interesting. This rock is like right on about where they think the corner of the basement would be. So did it support the cabin or is it just a rock somebody put there? They, they were not able to tell that conclusively. But eventually, we got down to this level. And at first, it was really exciting because we saw these dark stains in the soil. And there's this other dark stain over here. And in the late prehistoric, sometimes, people would make square houses where they would dig a trench in the soil, and then they'd put posts in them and fill them back in. And those trenches look a lot like those features. Unfortunately, when we cross-sectioned them, they had concrete in them. The ancient prehistoric people did not use concrete. So that was a drag. And that was probably part of the footing of the, um, of the garage foundation that was there. Matches up pretty well with it. Oh, but, you know, who knows? Maybe in this corner that's still dark up in there, maybe there's still the corner of the, um, maybe they were off a little bit, right? They thought it was going to be right in the center of this unit where the corner of the feature would be. They thought it'd be here. Well, maybe it is still there. You know, or maybe it's in here. So we don't know yet. That was kind of, we ran out of time. That's kind of the story of our working there. So that's a, a possible mystery, unanswered question. Is the corner still in this unit, and could you find it? Here's the other corner um, on the south end of the garage. Um, we had found this um, large feature, and we were kind of just tracing it along, and it seems to go under the lodge, this uh, cellar. So they must have torn the thing down and filled in the pit and built this, the lodge on top of it, basically on top of the cellar the thing. So we're searching along. And it looked like it was really disturbed when we got to this point. Like here's the kind of things, we dig in these flat levels because you can see a lot. Here's a pile of uh, cracked burnt rock with charcoal. And there's some more. Normally you would find this in a nice concentrated area. That is typical of a roasting pit. We've seen a couple of these at the site where um, people would, um, like you could roast a deer or something in this type of thing where you heat up a bunch of rocks and create like a, a a roasting pit. And some of these have produced, a, one of them produced a radiocarbonate of like 1620 AD, which would be, you know, proto historic, early fur trade, but not historic. So, but unfortunately, it's been damaged definitely because these rocks are on either side. And then you can see different bands of soil here that to me look like a pit that people filled in with different bands of dirt. And then there's something going on here. I don't know what it is. Well, they went, we were. Running out of time, this is a big unit, it's six feet over two meters square, it's over six feet square. So they decided to, in the, the idea was to get down to the bottom of the most promising area, so they just did this square. And actually that was a good move, because they were able to finish that square and it explained a lot. Unfortunately it explained that there was a plastic pipe there. Mm -hmm. We knew we were in trouble, 
when we started seeing Kmart bags on top of this thing, you know. But you know, that's one of the problems is you have a site that's been used for 8,000 years over and over again. Somebody drops some artifacts behind, right? Somebody makes a roasting pit, right? They leave. Somebody else comes along and puts a water pipe through it. Like I said, this is like, okay, 500 years? This will be fascinating. Look at, they use plastic for their water pipes, you know? They had abundant water and they didn't even recirculate it or something, who knows? But it's kind of nice, you can see the, you can see the pit now, but they put the pipe in. And that they filled this pit in, and there's a brick fragment in there, kind of goes that way, I don't know what's going on with here. Uh, maybe there's some more pipes, who knows? So, this one of the, the challenges is that, you know, we wanted to find out how big this feature is, it's all disturbed at this end of the site. We're never going to learn that by digging in this area. We're going to have to look for the other corner that's under the lodge, but we'll have to wait for the lodge to move out of the way or fall down. No, <coughs> no. no we're not crawling under there. Huh? It's too moldy. <laughs> and we also find at the site a number of upper Mississippian pits. The upper Mississippian is the last prehistoric period. Um, there are other sites in this area where people have been, these sites are similar to another site in Lake County, and it's thought that the Mississippi people would dig a pit, and then they would um, build kind of a fire in it, and then they would um, roast tubers from the marsh, water lotus tubers, like you roast potatoes. You know, or you could get clams or all kinds of stuff. And then they, when they were done with the pit, they'd dig it out and eat whatever they roasted, and then they would fill it back in with different kinds of garbage. And you can see different episodes of garbage that were deposited in this pit. You know, different episodes. And it's pretty nice. This pit is the other half of it. It's probably still there. Um, and this pit actually might show up on resistance if you didn't have the historic stuff, but it does. And we're actually, we have the soil. We eventually plan to get a radio carbonate on the soil, but it has to be water processed. And I didn't get it done before it got cold, so maybe this spring. And hopefully we'll get a radio carbonate that we'll be able to announce during our field season this year. That's my plan for that. So we see a lot of these pits. And this is the only example of a prehistoric feature other than the roasting pit that we found at the site. A feature is something like a pit or the base of a house or a burial. We haven't found any burials, thank goodness. But it's something that gives you like kind of constrained information. So you know, a nice thing about this feature is if I have animal bones from it and I have pottery from it, they're all going to be from the same time period. So I could look at what kind of animals the upper Mississippian people ate. And if I could find a feature from another time period, I could compare what people ate at different times, which might be kind of interesting. You know, how did they use the marsh at different periods? Um, one thing we find in these pits, we find a lot of turtle bones. So right away we know it was a warm season occupation, right? Because you have to be there from you know, late, really late spring, through the summer, and into the early fall. It can't have been a winter occupation problem. Um, but but uh, well, most of the problem is a lot of this stuff is jumbled together by later historic stuff. So here's my overall picture of what I think is happening at the site. There's an area of prehistoric artifacts where prehistoric people camped over and over again for 8,000 years, dropping various artifacts. There are very few features, or no features have been identified in this area of the site. So for most of the time that people camp there, they camp there for really short periods of time, and they did had little impact on the land. You know, they didn't build any houses, they didn't store any food, they maybe just like cooked something in the open, they laid, stayed in a, like maybe out in the open or in a high tent or something like that, and then they left. Um, the upper Mississippian pits from last year were right in this area. And we found others in this area. We found one here, and one down here, and one here. So on this line here, Upper Mississippi and Pitts are in this area to the left of that purple line. We do not know how far south they go. The furthest southmost route one is right here that we know of. So that's one question. They probably don't go too much further south. No matter what, the sewer system comes through, and this shows up on the radar. I looked a little bit of it from last year, and you can see these pipes going through here. So even if they are in this area, they've probably been ripped out by the sewer pipes. 
but there might be other upper Mississippian pits in this area. Then, later, after the upper Mississippian people came, historic people built a cabin with a fireplace and a basement. And then later people tore that cabin down and they took the bricks and they dumped it in the basement, which makes it really tedious to excavate because we like map everything. So if we find a brick, we make a map of where it is. We record that. And then we record how big it is and stuff like that. It takes a long time to get to all those bricks. And then at the very end, I think when they built the lodge, that basement pit was still kind of open and they dumped his great trash in there. So there's a lot of trash from the like early 1900s that's on the top of this old basement. And then later people came put a sewer system in, there was a cottage. People threw metal trash around the site in these areas. There was a shed that was torn down and there was more metal trash. So, you know, what it looks like to me, it looks like to me, like it's really, what Colin Lodge really is, is it's really a historic period site. <laughs> the intact part dates mainly from post-1890. It's associated with the Collier Lodge building. Which is good because the archaeology of the site is Hunting Lodge era, and the building is able to then go on the National Register of Historic Places as a contributing building. On its own, it would be hard to get on the register because it's very dilapidated and it's been changed a lot. I personally think, don't think that matters because it's you know, adaptable architecture. But for historian, historic architects, it seems to matter. And then, all that stuff goes into the upper Mississippian stuff, which is then put on top of earlier prehistoric stuff scattered throughout the area. So in the coming year, where once again, what we'll do is we'll give this kind of information to people that are participating at the DID, students and others. And we'll ask people to develop some theories about what they want to find. And this summer, we're going to test those theories. So if you think you might be coming out to the site, you might want to watch some of this stuff on the web, like a plan on the web. You might want to think about this and see what theories you might have. And come out and visit us and see if what we're finding in July, <coughs> for the first three weeks of July, Tuesday through Friday, uh, if any of the things that we're finding actually match what you think is going to be there. So that would be a nice thing to do. So at this point, I'd be glad to take any questions, if there's anything you're wondering about whatever it might be. Yeah. You say it's mostly marsh site, right? Marsh edge site. It was a big sand ridge on the edge of the marsh. OK, so what's to say your artifacts haven't been scattered for over the years because it's a marsh site? How would they get scattered? Well, I wouldn't call it a marsh site. They have floods. They, they have all ridge. kinds of things. Pardon? They have floods. Well, there's actually no evidence that it's ever flooded. We don't see any kind of soil deposition from uh, soils coming in, like alluvial soils coming in. So it doesn't look like this, and that's probably why people camped there. It was so high, it never flooded, apparently. Um, of course, they had been kind of churned up by trees and groundhogs and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Huh? Bioturbination. Bioturbination, exactly. So there's been a lot of, and then historic activity, right? Because <laughs> maybe prehistoric people dug a pit, filled it in really quickly, picked stuff up. Um, the site has never been plowed. That's one of the reasons that we find features. There are probably lots of sites where people camp in the marsh on these sand hills. But a lot of them have been wrecked because when you plow them, they deflate from erosion. The Collier Lodge was never plowed, so it's you know relatively intact, although it's so complicated, it's like messed up in some ways. Yeah. Thank you. Could you worry on this in terms of where the Kankakee River is? The Kankakee River is right next to the site and it goes right here. So this thing is here's the Kankakee River, and the site is like right on the riverbank. This uh, that little square up there, the riverbank is right here. And the old river channel flows right through here. It's cut off now because of the ditch. But you can see where the original river channel was. It's right on the river. And, and you said that because it's high, that might have been why people stopped there? Yeah. Uh -huh. is there Yeah, it's, um, the marsh is several miles wide over most of its area. But in this part of the marsh, there's a big tongue of like windblown sand from the <clears throat> post-glacial period that comes down into Porter County. And there, it picks up on the other side in Jasper County. So it's like kind of almost like a sand bridge 
of sand ridges meets right in this one area. So there's something about the geology and the wind patterns immediately after the glaciers that created this kind of sand island area that's really high. And, that, and the marsh there is really narrow. And that and shallow. And that's why it's a good place to camp right across the marsh. You only have to go maybe a few hundred yards through swampy water to get to actually sandy ground. And then there's a little path you can go along you know, to the next set of outlets. Versus if you're, for example, this is on Gong Bridge Road. If you go a few miles to the um, east, you go to 49. This is west of 49. If you look at 49 where the bridge is over the Cape Key, you know, it's like miles. You see the muckland where the old marsh was? It's about three miles till you get down to a wheat field, right, where it's actually dry land again. You know, so that present bridge only works because everything's been drained. The road, you know, the road was there in original condition, you still get a lot. Yeah? Yes? What's, uh, what's your depth horizon for the ground penetrating radar? It depends on what kind of antenna you have, but we typically on this, we're getting penetration down to like five meters, you know, 15 feet. We're using a 500 megahertz antenna. Um, yeah, and basically what that shows is that below, what you get below is like pure sand down to 15, down to five meters, down to 15 feet. So it's like a pure, we don't see any rock or bedrock or anything like that. Once you get below the historic stuff and prehistoric, there's like nothing to reflect it. But if you had a bigger antenna, you could get maybe 30, you know, 30 feet. 10 meters, maybe, yeah, maybe 10 meters, maybe 30 feet. But the problem with a bigger antenna is there's like nothing to see down there, and it doesn't pick up little objects. So yeah, it goes pretty deep. Yeah? Uh, with the artifacts, what, what is usually like the, like the mineralogy or like the, or the type of rocks that they use during like the pre-historic pre time? Well, that's a good question, yeah. You know, they would make tools out of stone, and maybe chip stone. So they would use chert, C-H-E-R-T. That's like a really poor quality flint. Uh, but in our area, there's, in some areas there's bedrock sources of that, where it comes out of limestone, and it's really good quality. But we don't have anything like that. All our stuff is glacial. So what they would do is they would find cobbles of this stuff that had been carried down by the glaciers, and pick appropriate fragments, and then try to make tools out of it. And so our tools are like really small because their resources were small. And then that shirt is like really hard. It's really hard to work. So we, I mean, and so that what that means is whenever somebody like somebody else would throw out a tool, chances are good that somebody else would pick it up and recycle it, you know, maybe millennia later. So we get a huge array of chert, diverse sources, but we've got all kinds of glacial chert, you know, who, it's never been characterized. But then we get exotic stuff, probably the most common stuff that's imported came from the St. Louis area. It's called Burlington shirt. And it would come up you know, the Illinois River and the Kankakee. We've seen stuff from southern Indiana, Wyandotte shirt. Even some stuff from central Ohio and from Michigan. There may be local glacial shirts, like you can find today or what we may find. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, the Burlington, the shirt from uh, St. Louis, the Burlington shirt is often heat treated. And in its natural state, it's really bright white. But when they heat treat it, it turns pink. So you can tell. And a lot of the glacial shirts were heat treated to try to make them more workable. You know, which was sometimes a mixed success. No, we have not found it, a thing that looked like heat treated yet. Because that would look like some kind of a sand pit, you know, that would have some turd waste, and we haven't seen anything like that. Yeah. That's a good question on top of the future that might be. But those are often are hard to see because they're just a, they pick a pit in the sand and they uh, put the churn in it and build a fire on it, on top of it. And then that heat would make the mineral, uh, mineral crystals get uh, you know, smaller and more even so it would be easier to work. So basically what you get is you get an area where you had a little pit that was quickly dug out, churn taken out, filled back in. Unless some of the church exploded or something, a pit that's refilled really quickly is really hard to see. It just doesn't leave a signature. I guess that. Any other questions? Yeah. Are you able to tell if there are 
different cultures of American Indians in that area, or had, or I can tell that how a specific tribe has evolved over the years, over the years, cultures <coughs> from the artifacts. That's a good question. That's an excellent question. And actually, I could go back to this one slide. Try to answer. You know, it's hard to talk about tribes. You know, that's a really specific entity of a relatively small number of people. And you can look at that in the historic record. But if you look at the way people live, for example, you know, there might be a group like the Potawatomi or the Ottawa, you know, that would be different tribes. Or there are even, like, say, right now, 8 to 12 tribes of Potawatomi, depending on how you count them, who would think of themselves as different tribes. But their material culture and the way they lived might not look any different, right? So archaeologically, you might not be able to tell. So what we try to do is really talk about kind of cultures that might be at the level of like a language group, right? So we could talk about, you know, the Algonquins, which would be like the Germanic language people in Europe or something like that. And it's interesting that um, starting in the early woodland period, we see a lot, or even in the later early woodland, we start to see evidence of artifacts that are really similar to what you see in central Illinois, suggesting there's a connection with people in central Illinois. And over this period, this pottery tends to evolve in ways that suggest that people in our area were in contact with those people, but were kind of doing their own thing, and were aware of what was going on, but were their own distinctive tribe. Then over time, um, this, they evolved, and we can pretty much trace the evolution of their culture from the Goodall to the, the Port phase to the Wachton phase. And then there's an abrupt change where a new kind of pottery called Albi pottery comes in. And this pottery is related to pottery that's found in Wisconsin and northern Illinois. So it looks like there might be kind of a, an intrusion of people into our area, although we're not sure about that. Then later on, we get this Fisher stuff that's even different from the Albi. And it looks like yet another group of people moving in from the north. And some people argue this actually correlates with kind of a warm climatic period where this happens. And then this Fisher Huber stuff goes up right to the historic period. And some people think that is the ancestors of people that spoke up uh, what's called Chirera Sioux. That would be like the uh, Winnebago or the Ho-Chunk in Wisconsin now. Their ancestors might have been down in this area. But then the problem is, when we get the problem historic and trade goods come in, all this time, we've traced people by their styles of pottery that they made themselves. In the proto historic period, they get trade goods, and they get these brass kettles, and they stop making their pottery, like maybe in a generation. And every site then looks the same. And it's really hard to trace people. And then right after this, we get the Iroquois Wars, and everybody moves in this area. So basically the problem is that the Iroquois Wars break our link <coughs> with the prehistoric past. And then it's hard to link that up to specific tribal groups. So, and archaeologists don't agree on which, we agree that these probably have living descendants today, <coughs> but archaeologists and Native Americans even don't agree on exactly who those descendants are. Some people say they're the Miami, some people say they're the Potawatomi, some people say they're like the Chihuahua Sea speakers, two speakers, some people say they're the Iowa. You know, they can't be all of those people. So do we just up? So it's kind of a complicated answer. That's why I mean your question was really great. Because that's like an unanswered research question. You know, how could you get at that problem? It's really difficult. And people are still working at it. That's a hot topic in research. You know, what was happening in this late prehistoric, early historic period. We don't have the latest prehistoric at our site, though. For some reason, people lived here during this one period, and then they didn't come back for another 150 years. Is that anything, anything you want to follow up on? Or maybe more than you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing else. Not really. OK. Yeah. And that also correlates with the decimation caused by the introduction of European diseases right in that area. Yeah, partially. But we do have the humor stuff in Lake County, and you get it in uh, Michigan, 
uh, on the St. Joseph River. So people were still living here during that time period. But definitely there's a huge population crash, you know, very, you know, post-1650 that must have an impact on the local population. And it could be that that population got really, maybe they moved back out of the area, went back north, and then other people came back in. Yeah? I don't think so. No. The marsh actually probably had a lot of medicinal plants. Sure. You know, if anything, it might be attractive to people looking for, you know, cures. Well, I mean, the population might have been tens, hundreds. Oh, in what kind of area? A Porter County? Well, no, just generally down there at the County Lodge. County Lodge? Thirty at most. A campment of thirty people maximum at any time. You're probably, you know, what who? Five, six families maybe at most staying there. Which is denser than it was in the historic period. We just got one family, two. <coughs> That's for really brief periods of time though. But you know, the whole population of Porter County might have been 150. So that's not bad. So this would be, I don't know how many people are in this room, 50, 60, 70? No. Maybe like half the population, you know, about a third of the population, half the population of Porter County and 1,200 would be here. So that'd be a really great lecture, wouldn't it? <laughs> population, yeah? So it gives you a sense of the scale, of empty. You know how empty the landscape was to people? You know, and how abundant the resources must have been. You know, you probably would never own a hundred or a fish anything. It wouldn't be possible. Any other questions? Well, thanks for being so attentive and for coming out tonight. Um, once again, if you want to come down and visit us, we'll be out there from July 5th to the 23rd or 22nd, uh, Tuesday through Friday. Typically, we start around 9 o'clock and we end about 3.30 and we're open to the public. And of course, some of you might be interested in participating and you're welcome to do that. The Historical Society has a lot more information on it. Thanks.